Hey guys, Corey here with another concept video. Today, it's all about the nervous system. In this video, we'll take a look at the central and peripheral nervous system, and we'll look at some specific nerve response models. Let's get started. Now, the nervous system is one of two systems responsible for detecting and responding to changes in the environment. And typically, when a more rapid or direct motor communication is required, the nervous system is the one that's involved. Good examples of nervous responses are what we call reflex responses, like when you accidentally touch a hot plate and jump back. But we'll look at them in more detail later. For now, I'd like to introduce you to two different systems, the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. And these two systems have some pretty important roles. The central nervous system's role is to store, arrange and manage incoming information. Whereas the peripheral nervous system, on the other hand, is mainly involved in the transmission of information to and from the central nervous system. This image helps us to outline the locations of the central and peripheral nervous system. As you can see, the central nervous system is made up of the spinal cord and brain, whereas the peripheral nervous system, shown in blue, runs all throughout the body and connects to your spinal cord. Now both the central and peripheral nervous systems are made up of nerve cells, which can also be called neurons. These neurons look quite different than most other cells you would think of, but that's because their job is very specialised. They need to be able to transmit electrical impulses long distances, so they need to be very long and thin. They do, however, have a few key components that you should know. First, they have things called dendrites, and these structures are the things that actually receive impulses from other neurons and then transmit the information into the cell. Second, we have the cell body itself, and this is where you would find the cell's nucleus, mitochondria and other organelles. And last, we have axons, which are the long, thin branches that extend from the cell body. These are extremely thin, but also extremely long, in some animals even up to a few metres. The job of axons is to transmit the message that was received by the dendrites to other neurons, or perhaps even other cells, like a muscle cell. At the end of an axon, we can see tiny axon branches, and electrical impulses travel all the way down axons, right to the end of these axon branches, where tiny swellings are located. These tiny swellings are actually able to release neurochemicals when they're stimulated, which then transmits the impulse to the next cell in the chain. Now this is the general structure of a nerve cell, but there are actually three different types of these cells and each has a different job to do. First, we have sensory neurons, which collect and transmit information from a receptor, say for example the light sensitive cells in your eyes, and send it to the central nervous system. We then have interneurons, which are nerves in your central nervous system that transmit messages from your sensory nerves to your motor nerves. And finally, we have motor nerves themselves, which transmit messages from your central nervous system to effectors, which could be, for example, a muscle or a gland. Now, these three nerves are all made up of the same components, but have slightly different shapes and structures due to their specific jobs. Sensory nerves, for example, which collect information, have long extensions between the cell body and the dendrites, called a dendron, which acts as an extra long receptor. Let's actually stop here for a bit and talk about these receptors because they're really important in allowing your body to detect changes in the environment. We talked last video about the stimulus response model and how important it is in allowing us to respond to changes. And it certainly would not be possible without the dendrites of sensory nerves to act as receptors of a stimulus. There are actually three different types of these sensory receptors and they're generally classified by their location. The first are called exterior receptors which detect external stimuli and are located near skin. The second are called interior receptors that detect internal stimuli and are located near your organs. And the third are called propyro receptors, which detect stimuli from skeletal muscle and ligaments. Okay, now let's get back to our nerve types. Interneurons are our second type and only have short axons because they just connect sensory nerves to motor nerves in the central nervous system. And finally, we have motor nerves themselves, which usually have short dendrites, but very long axons. Now, we've been talking a lot about these nerve cells transmitting messages between themselves, and you may actually be wondering how this happens. I mean, it's not like they can actually shout at each other. In actual fact, the answer is that when electrical impulses reach the end of an axon branch, something called a synaptic response, or a synapse, occurs. In this case, the electrical impulse stimulates the release of chemicals called neurotransmitters, which then diffuse the short distance between nerves and attach to receptors on the dendrites of the next cell. This attachment then stimulates the next nerve cell to transmit the electrical impulse and so on. Now that we understand a little more about the nervous system, let's take a look at some specific examples where this system is used. 
The first I'd like to introduce you to are reflex arcs. As mentioned before, these are immediate responses and usually involuntary. And by that, I mean they don't involve the brain. Reflex arcs are negative feedback responses, which often have a protective action, for example, pulling your hand out of a fire. Let's now look at a diagram to help us understand how they work. In this image, we have a stimulus, which is a person with their hand on a flame. The stimulus is detected by a sensory receptor, which would be a sensory nerve near the skin. An impulse then travels through the sensory nerve to an internerve via a synapse in the central nervous system. It is then transmitted through an internerve over to a motor nerve, again via a synapse. The motor nerve then transmits the impulse to an effector, which in these cases are always muscles. The muscle then contracts and the hand pulls away from the fire. You can see from this example that only nerves were used in transmitting the message and the message did not involve the brain and was therefore involuntary. Let's now take a look at a stimulus response example which does involve the brain but still only involves nerves. In this case I would like to talk to you about controlling blood CO2 levels. As mentioned in the stimulus response video, homeostasis is your body's ability to maintain balance and CO2 levels are just one of the things that your body constantly controls. CO2 levels need to stay around 5-7% and if they fall outside this range, the body can perform negative feedback mechanisms to pull them back into line. The following diagram will help us outline the steps controlling blood CO2 levels via nerves only. Let's imagine that the stimulus is an increase in blood CO2 levels. This actually lowers the blood pH and it is the drop in blood pH detected by your body, or more specifically, the chemoreceptor nerves in your brain. These nerves then send a message to the effectors, which in this case are your diaphragm, your intercostal muscles, and your heart. The effectors receive the message and start the response, which is an increase in the depth and rate of breathing. This increase in breathing then causes negative feedback as it allows for a lowering of blood CO2 and an increase in blood pH. The result of this is normal blood CO2 levels being restored. Well, that's it for the nervous system. I hope it helped, and as always, check back soon for more concept videos.